our next first speaker for the second session, uh, Dr. Douglas Nordley. Um, he is a professor of pediatrics, chief of the section of uh, pediatric neurology, and he's also the co-director of the Comprehensive Epilepsy Center. I think if I was to ask Dr. Nordley what he was claim of claim to fame should be is epilepsy. He lives, breathes, studies, manages epilepsy, and is really a fantastic neurologist, pediatrician, and a person. Focus is pediatric epilepsy, especially the early onset epilepsy. And I think, again, it's something that is so unique and critical and a time frame where we really need people like him to be able to manage our patients um, appropriately. Um, today, though, uh, he will be educating us on how celiac disease and epilepsy are linked. And I know there were some questions from the earlier session, Dr. Nordley, that will bring it into this session. Uh, but thank you so much for joining a GI uh, symposium um, and uh, take it away. Thank you so much, Dr. Berman. Thanks a lot for inviting me to join. I, you know, people are increasingly talking about the gut brain axis, and I think it's highly relevant to this uh, particular meeting. So um, I'm going to um, do this. I hope that you can see my screen. My main focus is going to be on celiac disease and epilepsy, but I am going to veer a little bit into cognition in the process because it's such an important um, part. So um, I have no disclosures for this particular talk. And, and what I wanted to do, I uh, hope this uh, works for you, is to begin with a history. This is actually one of the first patients that I saw um, with celiac disease and epilepsy. Hmm, this is gonna be probably like 22 years ago, I, I wanna say. So this was a seven-year-old right-handed girl who presented with multiple episodes of having prolonged unresponsiveness associated with some subtle changes. She would blink and chew. She first had febrile seizures when she was younger and at three and a half years of age. And very quickly after that, she began having these afebrile events. Her EGs demonstrated abnormalities, epilepsy was diagnosed and medication was begun. But unfortunately, instead of it helping her, she became progressively lethargic. She often had emesis and she was eating very poorly. So um, her folks transitioned her to another neurologist and, and in the course of time, she began having convulsions and episodes of clonic activity and diffuse tonic stiffening associated with unresponsiveness and, and myoclonic jerks as well. So EEGs were interpreted as showing changes consistent with the generalized epilepsy, although an ambulatory study did raise the question of this could be a focal epilepsy. So because of that, she was treated with more narrow spectrum agents you know, dedicated towards focal epilepsies like oxcarbazepine, carbamazepine, and lamotrigine, which didn't help. Phenytoin produced hives. Topiramate and tiagabine both worsened behavior and phenobarbital caused Stevens-Johnson syndrome. That's how much this um, uh, poor girl suffered. So um, when she was admitted for a video EG, she was unhappy about being in uh, to the hospital for a video EG. She came increasingly upset, but then afterwards she suddenly became unresponsive and, and apparently unaware of her surroundings. She would intermittently um, scream and kick and, and flail um, and then at, the, at that time, I started to see very distinct EEG changes, and they were punctuated by very, very subtle clinical manifestations, a little blinking, an occasional jerk here or there. And so I interpret, interpreted this as non-convulsive status epilepticus, although perhaps some people would have said, oh, this is some extreme form of like brain fog or encephalopathy. So... Um, she um, uh, awoke after we treated her with uh, benzodiazepines and afterwards her, her neurological examination was, was normal. Now this is quite striking. Let me take you through this. This is her EEG and a referential montage. People who aren't familiar with brainwave studies, this is the left side of her brain at, at the top, the left parasagittal. Here's the right parasagittal. Here's the left temporal and, and the right temporal. 
And so EEG should normally be a mixture of different rhythms in different locations of the brain. What's atypical about this picture of EEG is all of this slowing. And you'll note that this slowing is fairly continuous. It's, inter it's interrupted at times, but it's very abundant and it's maximal in the posterior regions of our brain. Um, so I obtained a celiac panel at, and it was positive. She was put on a gluten-free diet and then, and, and honest to goodness, this is how this happened. Then only afterwards, the mother said, oh yeah, several family members have celiac disease. And then subsequent to this, the patient's sister developed very similar spells with occipital spikes. And she was also put on a gluten-free diet and all of her spells also resolved. Here's our patient after being on the gluten-free diet. And you can see complete normalization of her EG. No longer do we see any of that background sewing. There's a beautiful organization of the EEG with an anterior to posterior voltage and frequency gradient and, and a marked transformation of her EEG. So this patient um, was uh, early on convinced me of that, that there was some connection. Now, why did it come to my mind? Because prior to this, I had the opportunity to visit with Professor Foyce, Alberto Foyce in Siena. Which reminds me, I think, I think um, that experience is, is, was still so lovely in my mind that I might suggest to Dr. Verma that the next meeting of this group would be in Siena, just out of you know, appropriate deference to Professor Foyce. In any event, uh, when I went there, he pulled me aside and he said, I want to show you a collection of patients that I have. This is back in, mm, it's going to be the early 90s. And and so he referenced this publication of 783 children. He was about to publish it, nine of which who had antibodies and positive jejunal biopsies. And three of them had occipital calcifications with what he called at that time complex partial seizures or what we would now call focal unaware seizures. And so here are those nine patients. And there's a couple of interesting things. One is that, um, that all of them were considered to be late onset and atypical in terms of their celiac disease. Here's their age of onset. Their EEGs showed a preponderance of activity in the posterior derivations, which is important. Their seizures were, at that time, we called them complex partial seizures or now focal unaware seizures, sometimes with symptoms that really pointed to the occipital lobes like transient blindness or amaurosis. And the imaging when abnormal, showed occipital abnormalities. So here are some typical examples. This is the first case that Dr. Foyce shared. And you can see this is a axial cut, a CT. Here's the front of the head and the back. This would be the left ear and the right ear over in this area. We're, we're looking at it. We, we use a radio, standard radiologic convention as if you were looking from the patient's feet. And so we see calcifications in the occipital region and also calcifications of the fox cerebri. So along with that, here's the EEG. And what Dr. Foyce is showing us is you, you see all these spikes that are embedded here. It's quite, quite nasty. And a lot of superimposed slowing as well. And interestingly, this is left occipital and right occipital. From time to time, these spikes appear frontally, and this is not uncommon, by the way, for occipital epilepsies. We see this all the time with paniotopus, for example, so-called clone spikes, where they seem to bypass the intermediate cortex and appear in the frontal derivations, usually with an appropriate time lag. So this observation um, was then um, repeated, um, this time in South America, and you can see the senior author, Natalio Fagerman here is quite well known in the Argentinian epilepsy group. And they reported 32 patients who had a constellation of epilepsy, occipital calcifications and celiac disease. Just like Professor Foyce, the majority had focal seizures. And many of the, uh, the times in 21 circumstances, the symptoms were referable to the occipital lobe. CT in seven showed hypodense areas in the white matter and, and in all cases showed occipital calcifications. So when you look at these cases a little bit more, there here's the criteria for diagnosing celiac disease in the patients. The mean age of onset is six years, 31 at focal seizures. And you can see, in addition to motor manifestations, the occipital semiology, 21 at visual phenomenon, 
eight with transient blindness, and two with visual illusions, and 14 with headache and vomiting. Vomiting is, by the way, uh, a not uncommon feature, autonomic feature that we will see with, with children with occipital epilepsies. The, these were not terribly frequent as far as pediatric epilepsy can, can be, um, but, but, but not infrequent. So they were most of the time one month, one per month, or sometimes less. The EEG, interestingly, didn't always show the abnormalities early on. In fact, in 19, it didn't show any abnormalities. But when abnormalities were found, there was a preponderance of, of features in the occipital and posterior quadrants. Intellectual performance was normal in most, but seven had learning disorders. Two had, were identified as having cognitive impairment, which would be an IQ less than two standard deviations from normal. And calcifications were evident at 26 patients at seizure onset. Here, you can see the same findings, right, as, as reported by Professor Foyce. Here's a normal CT, just for reference, and here we can make out the very prominent occipital calcifications that are present here. Now, if you look on MRI, you see something different. Earlier on, you can see lesions that on T2 weighted are increased signal and on T1 weighted are decreased signal. And so these, if you will, hypodense areas are prominent in the parietal occipital region in the same distribution as, as those occipital calcifications that we saw. So the Argentinians said, mm, we see more or less three groups of patients. Group one, they arbitrarily selected, were 11 patients that constituted 45% of the group that were seizure-free on a drug before they even went on a gluten-free diet. In, in group two, 37% or so of the patients, they became seizure-free even they had previously been on an anti-seizure medication and they subsequently became seizure-free when they were placed on the gluten-free diet. And then unfortunately, there was almost 17% of patients, four, whose seizures con continued despite both treatments. And even more concerning is that three of these patients developed, quote, an epileptic encephalopathy. So that term, if you're unfamiliar with it, what it, what it means in epilepsy circles is that is that there is a belief that the epilepsy itself is adding additional harm in terms of cognition to the patient. Something either about the EEG or the epilepsy, the seizures don't, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not defined as to which one it is. Any one of those could be contributing to the cognitive dysfunction. So in a, in a nice summary article of this, you see that epilepsy is, is being, associated and, and, and the prevalence um, figures range between zero and 7.2%. Um, and if you, if you look at it from another standpoint, which is interesting, if you say like, well, let's take a, given this occipital predominance, let's take a group of patients, children with occipital epilepsy and let's see what, what goes on. And that's what these authors did from Calabria. And they looked at 72 patients 25 of which had focal epilepsy from the occipital region. So occipital epilepsy. And 47 had focal epilepsy from the central region here. So-called what, what you, would, you and I would consider a typical Rolandic epilepsy. So occipital and Rolandic. And those in the central region, none of them had a positive antibody test. But in, in those patients from, that had occipital epilepsy, two out of 25, had positive antibodies and showed atrophy of the villi and hyperplasia of the crepes. The MRI was normal in one and revealed occipital calcifications in the other. So, you know, there's been debate like, well, what's the prevalence and is it truly increased in, in people with celiac disease? The relative risk of epilepsy in people with celiac is 2.1. The relative risk of celiac disease in people with epilepsy is 1.7. Um, this is a, a really nice, this article did a nice job of summarizing all of the pediatric studies done on individuals with epilepsy. But if you look at people with uh, epilepsy and celiac disease, you see the sum, summation here. Voice we already mentioned. And, and if you scan down the type of epilepsy, oh, pardon me, here's the, here's the percent cases of epilepsy and of their whole series. And then here is uh, the type, here are the types of seizures that you see, and you notice 
again, you know, a large number of focal seizures and, and sometimes associated with visual phenomena. So wearing my epileptology hat, as Dr. Verma said, is, is my, my uh, main focus. This, this strikes me as, as very significant. You know, as epileptologists, we often think in terms of triads, um, certain types of triads for syndrome classification and different types of triads for surgical localization. In this case, there, there's three really, three things that keep coming out of this in, in my experience with patients and in the published data is semiology. So the, the feature of the clinical seizures is, is, is uh, distinctive and has features pointing to the occipital and posterior quadrants. Second, the EG features, which are indisputable. You saw in our first case and in, the, in, in that EEG I showed you with Professor Foyce in the summary that tends to be occipital and posterior quadrant. And then finally, in this case, much like as if we were doing a surgical localization is we have imaging. So that congruence is really, uh, tells you that there is something quite real, that this is a thing. Now, it's a thing, but what else are the consequences of, of having this dysfunction, particularly in the posterior quadrants of the brain? Well, from just a pure electrophysiology standpoint, I'm just gonna stay focused on that because I know other speakers are gonna do delve into this further. If you look at visual evoke potentials, you can see abnormalities without MRI lesions. This is not surprising. Visual evoke potentials can be very sensitive detectors of cortical dysfunction in, in the visual pathways. And what the, what the authors reported was a prolongation of the so-called P100, the positivity that occurs 100 milliseconds after a flash of light or a fixation on a, on a pattern on a screen. And in, in one single um, case report, this abnormality normalized after being initiated on, on a uh, gluten-free diet. So in a summary of the neurophysiology of, this, of the celiac brain, um, I like this figure. Um, and um, discussing the EEG, which we already dealt with, the BAPs, which are, you wouldn't expect to be abnormal given their location and, and, they're, and they're not, um, with the exception of some uh, sensory neural hearing loss in some cases, and the VEPs we already mentioned. But the EEG um, features that I just described to you are relatively crude. Um, so I wanna take a little bit of a, um, a break from this and remind us, um, about some of the features of epilepsy. So we've known since 1873, when um, Dr. Hewlings Jackson postulated that epilepsy was due to this sudden and excessive and rapid discharge of brain cells, which is absolutely brilliant observation. And within a few decades, Hans Berger in Germany in the, in the 1920s recorded brain waves from human beings. And this is one of the earliest tracings that you can see. Here's this equipment. And what you're seeing here is the so-called alpha rhythm. And I bring this up because this rhythm is predominant in the occipital derivation. So we've known about this rhythm for over a hundred years. And electrophysiology has been at the core of our understanding of epilepsy, which is quite common, by the way. About 3 million people in the United States are estimated to have epilepsy. One in 26 of us will develop epilepsy at some point in our lives. And, a, and one in 10 of us will have a seizure at some point in our lives. Worldwide, it's 65 million people suffer from epilepsy. And, and pediatric, at least half of all adult cases start in pediatrics. So when you look at pediatrics, I really like this data from Mati Salampa in Finland. It was published in the New England Journal in 1998 and it's still highly relevant today. But Mati, what, 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 uh, what Salampa did is that he followed up patients that he saw originally in the 1960s, 30 years later. And he just found out how they were doing. And the population did not move a lot. So it was, he worked with Shlomer Shinar, who's a very gifted epidemiologist. And they tracked down the vast majority of these patients. And look at this, nearly 90% of them are in remission. So of all patients, nearly 90%. It kind of reminds me of cancer, right? Like, you know, our oncology colleagues have gotten so good at pediatric cancer that 90% of them are in remission. But like cancer, look at the consequences. So what he showed, these are the relative risk ratios. They were, his patients were two times less likely to, com 
complete secondary school. They were almost four times more likely to be unemployed and 3.5 times more likely to not be married. And these are people who said, I really would have liked to have been married and, and three times less likely to have children. And again, people who said, I really would have liked to have been married and had children. So in other words, something happened to these kids beyond their epilepsy that, la that made a lasting impression, deleterious impression on their lives. What was that? Well, we had another piece of data that came years ago from a colleague, a friend of mine, Blaise Bourgeois, who subsequently retired, but he was working originally in St. Louis and he evaluated 72 children with newly diagnosed epilepsy. And he did neuropsych testing at the onset of their epilepsy and then followed them yearly for four years. This is a beautiful study. And he, he used said controls. And what he found was that eight out of 72 had a decline of at least 10 IQ points. So epilepsy is more than seizures. Epilepsy, we actually define epilepsy as the predisposition to recurrent seizures. So in many ways, you can think of it as an interictal state. And there's much more that goes on because of that interictal predisposition. So you saw all these spikes and that nociferous bombardment of the cortex from these spikes. The brain doesn't just idly sit by and say, okay, I have spikes. It tries to suppress that with a surround of inhibition. So you'll often see focal slowing associated with those spikes as we saw in the example that I showed you. What's the consequence of that? Well, the brain works on electricity and it needs to process signals in an orderly fashion. And what we're learning more and more is that there's a, there appears to be a very clear correlation with electrical activity and a networking perspective and cognition. So one of the things I didn't tell you is that that IQ decline, if you look and, and over the, I've been doing epilepsy for over 30 years, if you look at children and you look at their neuropsych profiles with epilepsy in general, it doesn't matter where the lesion is, doesn't matter what kind of epilepsy, they have two common features if, they're, if their neuropsych is abnormal. Disproportionately, they have deficits with working memory and processing speed. So working memory, people are working on this and, and have been reporting that there is an association between working memory and a thing called theta gamma coupling. So what this means is that there are two different frequencies and they're in two different regions of the brain. These things are coupled and that appears to be very important for cognitive function, particularly working memory. So here's a, here from, I picked one recent article just to show you this. So this, what you're seeing here, well, let me go down here. So here is the underlying theta rhythm, right? And here are superimposed faster frequencies if you do a thing called a wavelet analysis, which we use all the time in our source localization work, you, what you see is bursts of activity that are rhythmic in, and thus the wavelets. And they coincide in an orderly fashion with the phase of the underlying theta rhythm. So here's just another way to express it. This is a fast Fourier transform, a so-called compressed spectral array showing you power as a function of frequency here. And here is the phase of the theta rhythm. And look at that. There's a very orderly, organized uh, relationship between gamma frequency activity, both the slow gamma is less than 80 and fast gamma is above 80 hertz. So there's a very clear association. And if you break it down, you see these two peaks in slow gamma and fast gamma that are associated with these theta alpha rhythms that occur. So in People have done this in a variety of different circumstances. You can look at mice and their decision to choose, you know, which way they're going to go in a tea maze and get and they get the reward. If you take mice that have cognitive dysfunction, what do they do? They try to compensate by ramping up their coupling. Their coupling straight strength goes up in this theta gamma coupling to try to correct for the deficiency in cognitive function. So this relationship between theta and gamma, another word for this is a bispectric. And it turns out that people have been looking at this for quite some time. This is an article from 1984, where um, in the optics field, people are looking at intense short bursts of lasers and trying to decode the information in the lasers. They were able to produce a bispectra 
And what they found is that you could deduce the original signal by using a thing called the triple correlation. So um, Wim van Dragelen is a um, signal processing expert here at University of Chicago, and he's in our section of pediatric neurology and a colleague of mine. And he came up with the idea of applying this technique that's used in visual processing to EEG. And you can see the mathematics here. It's, but if you just look at it here, it's, it's, it's quite simple. It's you take a neuron at a, diff, at a certain location at a certain time, and you compare it to another neuron at a, another time point, and yet again to a second neuron and, and at a different time point. So in other words, you have to, you have to determine um, three, three different neuronal locations or three different, three different places and their interactions. The theorem predicts that you can uniquely reconstruct the original data. So what does that mean? So I, I mentioned in passing that this very interesting theta gamma coupling is called the bispectra. The bispectra is included in this analysis. So what Vim um, wrote this paper and, and archived it. And what you are seeing is neuronal firing over here, so-called raster network. And you can break this up into various motif classes, um, ways that three neurons could potentially interact. One neuron by itself, two neurons, and then three neurons. And there's always, there's 14 different ways that they could interact. These have familiar, um, you'll recognize things like ideas like feed forward, um, convergence, divergence, synchrony. There's autocorrelation and cross-correlation. It's all embedded in this triple correlation analysis. What does the data look like? If you look at simulated rasters, you see the motif classes can be represented here. And you can do this in a variety of ways, including looking at amplitude as, as, a, as, as compared to noise. So fundamentally, it's a, it's a simple way to reduce this complex network um, mathematically into a graphical representation that, that you can uh, perceive. So I don't believe it has been used um, at all in patients with celiac disease, but it might be a very interesting um, mathematical uh, tool to use. I just wanted to put that forward. We are uh, looking at this in a variety of different genetic conditions and also in people with epilepsy. You can use this technique also to automate the detection of seizures, by the way. So in conclusion, although the, there's some controversial epidemiology, as, as the epileptologist me would say, this is a clear clinical phenotype. So I believe this association and the fact that all of the patients improve with therapy. And there are very clear electrophysiologic changes that have been reported kind of crudely but uh, these could be studied using quantitative EEG techniques, like such as the one that I mentioned, and might be nice complements to some of the other sophisticated analyses that we're gonna hear more about from an imaging perspective. And with that, I'll, I'll stop here and stop sharing and, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Nordley. Uh, really thought-provoking, and I'm sure that there'll be um, many questions that we will have later on. At least I already have some questions for you. So thank you so much. Um, and then you'll join us at the Q&A at the end of this session. Uh, so moving along, um, we have our next speaker is Dr. Crowell. He is a research fellow at the University of Sheffield in England in the Department of Infection Immun Immunity and Cardiovascular Disease. So we have neurology, we have neuropsychology, we have GI, and here we have someone who's, uh, I think, spent a lot of time learning and studying and educating us on gluten sensitivity, celiac disease. As I understand, you've been in this space since 2017. Um, and your interest is very interesting in the sense that uh, you are looking at more the cognitive, the neuroscience, and how it really affects and impacts a patient's cognition and quality of life. I think all wonderful things. And what I am going to do is really not talk so much, but have you educate us more on how imaging studies unlock the secrets of neurological manifestations in gluten. And I will leave it at that, gluten sensitivity, celiac, celiac, 
any of that that you will spend the next 30 minutes teaching us. So thank you so much, Dr. Kroll, your floor. Uh, thank you, Ritu, and thank you also just to the uh, University of Chicago um, for having me here. Uh, hopefully everyone can see the screen. Let me know if you can't. Um, so I feel like I've given a few talks over the past few months, um, including one for um, at Chicago, I think at the end of last year. Um, so for the talk today, I wanted to try and discuss these things from a slightly different perspective. Uh, just in case of any kind of repeat audience. Um, so as Rita was explaining, I have a background in kind of neuropsychology, um, lots of neuroscience, lots of using brain imaging um, in research. And I think a lot of the research that we do at the University of Sheffield um, tries to kind of use this as the linchpin involved in it. So today, what I was going to do was actually give almost a bit of a crash course in neuroimaging, and then sort of from that perspective, give a few examples of how it can be used in research to do with uh, gluten sensitivity. So what can neuroimaging contribute to patient care and research? Um, it's a bit of a buzzwordy sort of answer, but the answer to that is biomarkers. Um, so anyone who's sort of familiar with medical research at all, uh, biomarker is a term used throughout it. A biomarker is a measurable indicator of, of the severity or presence of some disease state. And that quote is from the Sage Minds from Wikipedia. Um, but it's a very good quote. Uh, it's basically a fancy way of saying um, any kind of measurement we can get reliably. And you know, in this case, I'm obviously going to be talking about brain imaging. So any kind of measurement we can get from brain MRI scanning that can either help us diagnose um, a condition or kind of measure the severity of it or measure features of it, which we know may be relevant to the patient's experience of the world and outcome. I'm going to give a one slide overview here of MRI scanning. Um, now, I am not an MR physicist in my background, so the best I can really do is give a conceptual overview of this as well. Um, but an MRI scanner, as I think people will hopefully be familiar with, is basically a giant magnet. How does it work? Um, very good question. So all of the atoms in our bodies uh, have essentially small electrical charges to them, and that means that they also have slight magnetic properties as well. When we lie in a very strong magnetic field, as we do when we get into an MRI scanner, um, ordinarily, all of our atoms are, are kind of spinning around in any random direction. So essentially, the poles of them, the magnetic poles, are kind of pointing randomly. But when we lie in the MRI scanner, that really strong external magnetic field means that all of these atoms uh, align along the magnetic field and kind of point in the same direction. Then, when the scan is happening, we kind of have radio waves which are fired at us. These radio waves push, if you will, the atoms off that alignment and kind of hold them in place using kind of magic physics jiggery pokery. Um, in the example given in this screen, I should be giving a point number three here, we can see that's kind of at 90 degrees perpendicular to where they want to be. When the radio waves stop, the, mag the uh, atoms then kind of relax, is the term used, and attempt to realign with the magnetic field that they were in. The trick that we get here is that different types of tissue, um, the atoms in them, realign at different speeds. So if we kind of halfway through that process, we might find that some body tissues have achieved that alignment quicker than others. Um, depending on how much realignment has been achieved, there will be more or less local magnetic signal, which is then converted to more or less electric signal, um, which we then just see as higher or lower pixel values. So when we look at an MRI scan of the brain, what looks to us like a quite intuitive photo of the brain, um, what we're really seeing here are just high or low areas of magnetic signal, which are taken at a point very shortly after that radio wave has stopped being applied. And it just happens to correspond very helpfully to different kinds of tissue in the brain. This particular kind of brain scan is called a flare scan. Flare scans are used throughout neuroimaging. Um, I'm going to move to a case here of a rather unhealthy flare scan. So this is a patient with a form of dementia, um, a subtype of dementia called vascular dementia. And uh, the flare scans here are very useful for diagnosis and kind of tracking patients. Um, if you are a clinical neurologist and you're treating a patient such as this, you would want to do this imaging because it reveals a number of things. 
First of all, it reveals that this particular patient um, has enlarged ventricles in the middle of the brain, those kind of black areas. Um, it's quite intuitive to kind of to the human eye to see that they're larger. And that is taken to be a sign that some brain atrophy has occurred. The brain has shrunk somewhat, meaning that these fluid filled spaces have uh, conversely increased in size. Perhaps the most obvious thing are these kind of white stretches. Um, now, from Douglas before me, we, we've already heard a bit about white matter changes. On imaging, this is what we're talking about. This is part of the brain's white matter. And we get these white matter hyperintensities on this kind of brain scan called a flare scan, which appear as very kind of white, you know, obvious kind of white stretches of blobs. These are white matter lesions. And we can also see a few things in here that almost look like holes in the white matter lesions as well. And that is, in fact, exactly what they are. These are small lacoons, and for this particular patient, each one of those represents a different small vessel stroke that this patient has had. So if we want to convert all these clinical observations, which are useful in the diagnosis and the tracking of the patient, we want to become a bit of a scientist about it, we might start to ask questions like, well, if we really try and measure these things, how useful are these numerically? You know, if we measure the brain volume, that's surely going to be an indicator of how much atrophy has occurred. We could measure the actual volume of white matter lesions and, you know, presume that more of it is worse than less. Or we could even just count the number of lacoons and similarly assume that if more lacoons are present, then the patient isn't doing quite so well. And we do studies exactly like this. Um, so this is data presented actually from my previous job before I joined Sheffield, where we had 100 or so patients with small vessel disease of vascular dementia. We did exactly this. Down on the left hand side of the screen, um, we measured the whole brain volume, the number of lacoons, and also the white matter hyperintensity lesion load, which is essentially what percentage of their brain is white matter lesion. And we correlated these with different cognitive outcomes along the top of the screen here. The idea being that any correlations we find are then evidence that that measurement that we're getting from an image is actually relevant to the patient's outcome and their experience of the world. So the numbers in brackets are the p-values. There was one significant result doing this with whole brain volume, uh, volume, volume for the mocha. Um, the mocha famously being the cognitive test which Donald Trump said that he aced when he did it, got 30 out of 30. Um, the number of lacoons gave three correlations. So that actually appears to be very relevant to the patient's outcome and experience of the world. Um, and then finally, even though it's perhaps the most obvious thing to look at on an image and a defining part of the condition, um, white matter hyperintensity lesion load had no correlations, which is a nice reminder that, you know, the things that look most obvious to the eye may not actually always be the most relevant thing to a patient's experience. So that was the image we were just looking at there. And the last point I want to get across conceptually about these sorts of scans is that the features that we see are not, you know, this is not the same as taking a photo of the brain. It's tempting to look at this and imagine if you rather unkindly kind of sliced into a brain and, and took a black and white photo of it, this is what we'd see. But if someone actually does that exact experiment, um, we can see that, you know, it, it's not quite as obvious as the patient example I've had, but this is um, post-mortem brain tissue where we can see the characteristic white matter hyperintensity on the flare scan. But we actually see that with the naked eye, you can't really spot anything going on there. Similarly, there's a number of different types of uh, MRI scans. We have T1 weighted scans, we have T2 weighted scans, and, and a flare scan, which is, which is a variant of a T2 weighted scan, essentially. The point of all this being that we're not really seeing a picture of what the brain looks like truly visually. What we're doing is manipulating different properties of the tissue and we can almost do this in such a way to highlight things which we know are most interesting to us. So if we want to do an experiment where we want to see if there are these characteristic white matter lesions, we know that we want to do a flare scan because that's where we get these big blobs. But if we want to just look structurally at the brain, then kind of with good contrast between gray matter and white matter, then we kind of know the best thing to do there is a T1 weighted image. Applying this finally to gluten related conditions, um, at the University of Sheffield and the local hospital, which we collaborate with, um, we have got a clinic which is dedicated to treating patients who have neurological forms of gluten sensitivity. Um, some of these patients have epilepsy uh, as a side, but um, we mainly kind of see phenotypes, which are the ones on screen at the moment. So gluten ataxia is one such phenotype. This is characterized um, by very marked atrophy of the cerebellum. 
uh, which is very shriveled and wrinkled in this uh, particular case. And gluten encephalopathy, uh, where the cerebellum may well be spared, but in the cerebrum, the higher parts of the brain, we will often see an excess of white matter lesions. And just to make the point, these patients may or may not also have celiac disease. Um, but all of these uh, kind of down, all of these problems can be quite severe, but down to gluten sensitivity. And the imaging that we get, the information we get on imaging matches very nicely uh, with the symptoms that we then see. You know, so if we see on imaging, uh, structural imaging, that the cerebellum has undergone atrophy, sure enough, the patient will have issues to movement coordination and sensation. These are the things that the cerebellum is very involved in in its function. And then we get more of a, a picture of kind of cognition and cognitive problems if the white matter has been involved, foggy brain kind of experiences, and also much more kind of migraineurs, uh, very bad headaches in that cohort. So bringing all this back to the buzzword biomarkers, we get from this picture of gluten ataxia, maybe atrophy, maybe brain volume of the cerebellum specifically is a relevant biomarker for this phenotype of patient. And similarly, maybe um, white matter volume or you know if there are excess white matter lesions or not maybe a good biomarker for patients of the gluten encephalopathy phenotype and just to take you through a few experiments now um, which have kind of gone to gone to task on these ideas um, this particular one was one published a few years ago now where we recruited 100 patients with celiac disease from the gastroenterology department none of whom had any previous neurological history, and all of them were recruited at the earliest point in diagnosis. So essentially, uh, this group is, you know, as conventional celiac disease as, as we were attempting to get, um, also at a very early point in their disease course. And we then did a full neurological characterization of them, which is kind of shown in this graphic on the left of the screen. So the rates of things in red are on clinical examination by consultant neurologists, and the rates of things in blue are things that the patient self-reported. And we see a lot of cerebellar type things being brought up here. So signs of peripheral neuropathy and walking difficulty matching up in the prevalences quite neatly with what was self-reported. Along, uh, along the lines of balance problems and sensory symptoms. And then sure enough, we then did this imaging experiment. Um, I was interested in a blood marker called, uh, well, antibodies to transglutaminase 6, which is a relatively novel uh, serological marker, which we're interested in at Sheffield. Um, it's thought to be relevant in cases of gluten ataxia. So we were going in here with the hypothesis that if a celiac disease patient also had TG6 antibodies that might be an indicator that they're at relatively higher risk of neurological consequences. 40%, 40 of this cohort had TG6 um, antibodies. And yes, those that did um, had statistically significantly lower uh, brain volume of the cerebellar gray matter compared to those that didn't. We much more recently did a follow up of 30 of these patients um, and repeated all of these examinations. Uh, so what this study was then really quite driven by, you know, we're, we're very interested, obviously, in, in the progression of these things over time. And what we think we see in the clinic and what we're kind of wanting to show with this um, is that, you know, patients who go on to do very well on the diet do respond well neurologically, or it can at least, you know, kind of arrest or slow down progression of problems. We expect some brain atrophy, even in healthy people. So, you know, some rate of this over time is, is expected. But what we did here was we looked to see how many people on follow-up seven years later had achieved negativity of all gluten-related antibodies and run some comparisons against that subgroup against those who were still positive for at least one gluten-related antibody. Um, and it actually happened that it was exactly half and half. So, you know, 15 of these patients were negative for everything and 15 were still positive for at least one thing. We measured the volume of the cerebellar gray matter again at baseline and at follow-up, took the difference between the two time points, then also kind of subdivided that difference by the actual length of time between the scans. So what we wind up with is a measurement which is the yearly percentage volume loss of the cerebellar gray matter. And we compared that between the two groups. And again, yes, um, those that had achieved negativity of all gluten related antibodies had a significantly lower uh, loss, if you will. You know, they lost less 
brain volume from the cerebellum compared to those who had not achieved negativity of all gluten related antibodies, it was um, minus 0.32% compared to minus 0.73%. Uh, so that was, for me, was certainly quite an exciting study because um, it's the first time, you know, that imaging has been used to kind of actually prove a, a protective effect um, if immune negativity can be achieved. And again, just as a reminder, I, I know I started this talk by focusing on the, the rather niche um, and somewhat rarer uh, presentations of people with kind of explicit neurological conditions to do with gluten. But all of the data I've just been discussing, again, these are people with typical celiac disease uh, diagnosed through the gastroenterologist, just to kind of reiter reiterate the relevance of this and the generalizability of it. So that was about, you know, the, the hints about cerebellum being involved in celiac disease. What about white matter lesions? Um, and the short answer again is yes, you know, there are indications as well that these extend into celiac disease as well, um, perhaps to a lesser extent, but, you know, it, it seems to be, it seems to have this kind of continuing spectrum and relevance. So on the left here is, is that same publication of the 100 patients who were kind of given a neurological characterization from the gastroenterologists. Um, and it was found um, when they were assessed, when the scans were assessed by a consultant neuroradiologist, that a quarter of them um, had more white matter lesions than would be expected for their age. And uh, as a point of comparison, there was a database we had access to of 525 healthy controls, and the same neurologist um, found uh, only 3% of those to have, in their opinion, more white matter lesions than should be expected. And, and that was a highly significant comparison, needless to say. Um, and similarly, this older study uh, focused on some patients with celiac disease who had then been referred to a neurologist because they were starting to experience real issues. And again, there was a, a suspiciously high rate of white matter lesions found in that group as well, particularly in those who were experiencing headaches as well. And when I started out this talk um, discussing vascular dementia, that, that wasn't as a kind of idle comparison. It, it's a thing which keeps coming up for me. Um, it was possibly because it was what I was studying in my previous job. I'm sure that biases me a little bit. Uh, but this, um, there's been this very large population research by perhaps some uh, names who are familiar to people uh, watching um, where they took, I think it was Swedish epidemiolo epidemiological data. It was a very large data set. And they found that people with celiac disease do go on to have an increased risk of developing vascular type dementia specifically. Um, so this kind of synergy in, the, in this picture seems for me to keep being built up of, you know, white matter lesions in, in uh, an apparently vascular pattern in celiac disease, perhaps involvement of the vasculature in the blood vessels, some inflammation there maybe, um, and then also this, this overall increased risk of vascular type dementia as well. Moving on to stranger scans, um, the MRI scanner can do things which get a bit more kind of abstract, um, if you will. So magnetic resonance spectroscopy is one of these techniques. We don't so much get a picture from this, uh, but this is a scan that kind of focuses on a particular area of the brain, you know, wherever you want to focus on. You kind of make it an imaginary cube in, in a point of space. You do the spectroscopy scan and you get this kind of, what well, we call it a spectra on the right, which looks like a bit of a seismograph. And essentially the height of these peaks and also corresponding them to their location on this chemical shift axis tells us what metabolites are present in that part of the brain and in what concentration. A higher peak means more concentration, essentially. The one I'm gonna focus on here is the one marked NAA in blue, which stands for N-acetyl aspartate. Um, this is something which we have found is very useful in the diagnosis of patients at the specialist clinic. Um, patients who have neurological gluten sensitivity seem to very reliably have decreased NAA compared to controls. Um, so we've actually come up with local cutoff points which are used as part of that diagnostic process. And then the paper currently shown um, also goes on to show that it's us useful for tracking patient progress. Um, we can see that patients who go on a gluten-free diet strictly and have complete immunological negativity from it actually see a recovery of NAA um, in the vermis of the cerebellum, uh, which is the part we most look at with this. And patients who refuse to go on a diet, who, who elect not to, actually see that the NAA continues to decrease. And then almost kind of to complete this, 
graph those who have partial who those who attempt to go on the diet and only have partial success with it see a kind of a flat line with it so it seems to be very relevant for you know diagnosis also tracking patients over time lastly um if any of you have seen me give a talk before you'll have seen a slide like this this kind of spinning rainbow spaghetti brain is something i use all the time um this is a kind of scan uh, called diffusion tensor imaging which you can get from an mri scanner I've talked a lot about the white matter of the brain to actually tell you what that is more specifically. The white matter are kind of like the wires that run through the head and connect all the gray matter regions together. And they literally are like wires. Um, they're kind of bundles of nerve fibers that kind of run in, in sort of threads. Um, a DTI scan essentially images the brain's white matter. And the thought experiment to describe how it does that is that the DTI scan is sensitive to detecting how water molecules diffuse in three-dimensional space. How does that let you see the brain's white matter? Well, you say, imagine a water molecule inside of a wire, inside the axon of a neuron. It is going to be able to diffuse quite freely up and down the length of that axon because it's relatively unimpeded, but it will not be able to diffuse well into the sides of that axon, into the walls of it, before it kind of bumps into you know, some extra tissue or whatever, what have you. So we do a DTI scan, and in every pixel of the DTI scan, or voxel, I should really say, we measure the diffusion properties of water as kind of like a 3D blob, which is what's shown on the right here. And some of these, if they're really in the middle of a coherent fiber track, we see a very one directional, that water movement behavior. But if we're in the middle of cerebrospinal fluid, the water diffusion is kind of unidirectional. So we can then from this extrapolate into these kind of three dimensional tractography images, or we can do a more conventional kind of brain imaging analysis where we can kind of put numbers to this and, you know, for, for these three dimensional shapes, we can actually convert that to a number, for example, between zero and one, where one means that water movement is entirely one directional um, and zero would mean it diffuses freely, uh, to, you know, by the same magnitude in every direction. And going back to this earlier slide when I was talking about patients with vascular dementia and what markers we get that correspond to their cognitive health, I was hiding a final row. Um, we also included a DTI measurement, which is written here as fractional anisotropy, uh, the median fractional anisotropy. And even though, you know, when you start talking about these kind of advanced scans, they start to sound increasingly kind of contrived and increasingly like, oh, you're just, you know, you're forgetting about what matters, what you're even really measuring anymore. But DTI is very popular because in spite of all that, it is incredibly sensitive at picking up changes in white matter tracts, which are rel relevant to cognitive health. And that's what we found with this data set of the vascular dementia patients. You know, it, it outperformed the brain atrophy measurement, it outperformed how many lacoons, how many strokes they'd even had. Uh, you know, this kind of weird measurement of water diffusion did better than all the rest at, at kind of finding the thing that's relevant to cognitive health. And we've applied this in celiac disease as well. So this slide is from a study which, which I've talked about on a number of occasions, where we took uh, third party population data from a data set in the UK called the UK Biobank. And we wanted to see in this um, if these kind of population data set celiac disease patients had signs or symptoms of neuro and cognitive change compared to controls. And, and we did find that there, were, there was a cognitive deficit in processing speed. There were some indications of worsened mental health. Um, and on this slide was the DTI analysis we did. It was the first time that DTI had been used in the study of, of gluten at all. Um, what we're looking at here is kind of like a template of the white matter tracts in the brain. The areas which have got a red to a yellow blob are areas of white matter tracts where the celiac disease group had significantly different metrics compared to the matched control group, which we take to be a sign of kind of microstructural um, harm, which is, or, you know, change which has occurred in the white matter tracts due to the celiac disease. So in summary, um, these techniques give us a better understanding of the neurological complications across the whole spectrum of gluten sensitivity. You know, the advanced scans let us identify changes which you might not be able to see, as it were, on conventional imaging. And as we've already discussed as well, the conventional imaging lets you see things in the brain which you can't even see with the naked eye, um, you know, like your white matter lesions. And all of this put together really helps validate these, is these issues in celiac disease. Now, for the last five minutes, which is what I think I've got left, um, I'm just going to kind of introduce a study which we're running at the moment, which is coming fairly close to the end.
um, which has got the rather kind of ambitious title of gluten as a risk factor for dementia or the GLUDEM study. To give the background of this, I'm very briefly going to talk about antibodies involved in gluten sensitivity. As people here, um, you know, many of you I'm, I'm sure will be familiar, celiac disease has pretty much a one-to-one -one relationship, you know, more or less with having TG2 and endomysial antibodies uh, when it is active, at least. And also we will find gliadin antibodies as well in pretty much 100% for cases too. In these more kind of unusual, but you know, very interesting types of neurological gluten sensitivity like ataxia and encephalopathy, these patients do not by definition have celiac disease. So they do not necessarily have TG2 or endomysial antibodies, but they will still have at pretty much 100% rate have gliadin antibodies. So we start to ask the question, you know, we know these are autoimmune conditions. What have the gliadin antibodies got to do with the neurological things that we see, if anything? And there are some studies out there which um, give us some cause to think about this. You know, this study shows that gliadin antibodies show reactive properties with brain blood vessels, you know, kind of shadows of vascular dementia there again, perhaps, um, that it reacts with a protein which is only found in neurons. Um, that it has reactive properties with cerebellar brain cells, not shown on the slides, but there was a study showing that it's correlated with levels of inflammation found in the brain. There was a study showing that it's correlated with levels of depressive symptoms, both in people with celiac disease and also in healthy controls too. And we also know that along with the rest of it, a successful gluten-free diet will eliminate gliadin antibodies from the blood over a period of about six months. However, if you look up gliadin antibodies in you know, conventional medical guidance, pretty much the only thing you'll find is something like this saying, don't bother doing it, it's useless, um, it's irrelevant. The reason for that is that one in 10 of all people have gliadin antibodies, uh, which of course gives it awful specificity um, as a serological test for celiac disease. However, and I think this is where you know, some of the biases within the literature have kind of been shown and come in, um, you know, this, this focusing on can it detect celiac disease or not? No, well, then we're not interested. It, it's potentially a bit of a blink of view. It feels a bit when you look through the literature, like no one's really stopped to ask the question, is this still okay anyway, you know, in, in this one in 10 people? So we're left here with this kind of assumption that it's benign, or actually, might we still want to double check that, that people who have it who don't have celiac disease, you know, what's that implication, if anything? This is interesting in dementia, coming back to this, because dementia research is very preoccupied with what we call modifiable risk factors. There's a number of things we can do in our day-to-day -day lives which have a really tangible um, effect on our risk of developing dementia. Basically, anything that's good for us in a general sense, particularly for our heart, is good for our brain. Um, and you know, the, the, some list on the screen here, a uh, very big study in the Lancet has estimated that up to 40% of all dementias um, are attributable to these risk factors, which can be changed and uh, modified in someone's day-to-day -day life. Can gluten be in here as well? You know, if, the, if gliadin is shown to be unhealthy to have in our blood, then the one in 10 people could go on a gluten-free diet and have some protective benefit for their brain as a consequence. So the design for the study is that we estimated needing to recruit 390 people. The reason for that was to find the one in 10 who have Gliadin antibodies, power calculations told us we needed 39 in that group. Um, these are all people who are completely healthy from the general population, no celiac disease or any other signs of gluten sensitivity um, in the self-reported sense. Uh, so compare them against 39 match controls. And then we want to collect all these sorts of measurements I've discussed in this talk. Uh, the primary outcome will be diffusion tensor imaging. Then we're also gonna be looking at flare scans structural scans, brain biochemistry, cognitive performance, and also quality of life too, and get a complete picture of this uh, to see if gliadin antibodies do show any indication that they have led to any kind of worsening of these factors in the healthy, in the apparently healthy controls who have it compared to those who don't. So far, uh, it, it began in 2019, November, projected from for two years. That should mean we're basically done a few months ago, right? No, there was a pandemic, um, which made two years a very abstract proposition all of a sudden. Uh, but we did restart the research in April um, last year, about a year ago now. We've currently identified 27 gliadin positive participants at a positivity rate of 13.6%. And we're anticipating to complete data collection by the end of this year. So watch this space. That just leaves me to say thank you very much um, again for having me here today. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening.
thank you to my uh, colleagues here in Sheffield and to all the different funders that we have as well. Thank you very much, Ian, and we'll definitely watch the space and I would say watch this person. This is the future for looking at celiac disease, non-celiac gluten sensitivity and the neurological manifestations. So we'll have you join us again for the Q&A. So definitely watch the space. You're too kind. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so our last but not the least speaker is Dr. Deepika Sharma. She is one of the research fellows in Dr. Jabri's lab. Um, and she has recently joined the lab and um, has been around for a while, but recently joined Dr. Jabri's lab. And her interest is more in intestinal immunity. And I think we all know that celiac disease is part of the spectrum with intestinal damage, immunity, and so on. And today, um, Dr. Sharma will be talking, taking a, just a closer look at the neurological implications of GI diseases, including those associated with the gluten challenge. There's always a lot of challenge discussing about gluten challenge. So hopefully, Dr. Sharma, you will help us uh, unravel that mystery a little bit. So Dr. Sharma, your floor. Um, I am trying to share the screen. Are you able to share that yes. or do you need to? Yeah, now we did. It's okay, perfect. There we go. Excellent. Thank you. Um, thank you to CME for giving me a chance to talk about um, some of the ideas that we have in lab that kind of explain the crosstalk between the immune system and the neuronal system that not only underlies the GI manifestations, but also the neurological manifestations associated not just with gluten challenge, but also in other inflammatory diseases. So to delve into this, the first, I'll, I'll give a brief description of what the immune system actually entails and why the immune system goes haywire and causes these neurological manifestations um, that we see in some of the patients with the celiac disease. Now, the immune system has two different compartments, the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. The differences, there are two major differences between these two. One is that the innate system recognizes non-specific molecules, which are usually structural moieties associated with a pathogen or a damage. The recognition of the ligand is really quick and the response of the innate immune system is really quick. So it forms almost the first arm of, of immunity. What we have in the form of something that maintains a long-term immune response is the adaptive immune system that includes B cells and T cells. This arm of the immune system is often slow acting because it requires the innate arm to acquire certain peptides, present it to the adaptive immune cells, and then have them take on the immune response from there on. So it's, it has a higher specificity than the innate immune response, but it's also slower acting. Now, the major function of the immune response is to be able to contain a pathogenic insult. So under insult from a pathogen, we should instigate an inflammatory response that over the course of time, veins out and the tissue that undergoes resolution. What happens, unfortunately, in the case of celiac disease is that the body and the immune system kind of starts to act like gluten is a pathogenic substance as opposed to being an innocuous dietary antigen. So in response to gluten, we start to have an inflammatory response that eventually veins away if the host goes on a gluten-free diet. So what we see in celiac disease is basically hijacking and dysfunction of an immune response that exists to combat infections and sterile insults. Now, what is this immune response in the case of celiac disease? Um, it is celiac disease is more dominant in patients that have uh, you know, a particular HLA subtype, HLA-DQ2 and HLA-DQ8. 
the reason these molecules are important is because these are MHC molecules that can present the peptides that see that the gluten generates. So either the antigen presenting cells or the gut epithelial cells are able to present the gluten peptide. And once the, once the MHC docks the gluten peptide, the CD40 cells that are specific to gluten will get activated and do a couple of things. One of them is that they will produce a lot of cytokines such as interferon, gamma, and DNA alpha. Then they're gonna provide help to B cells such that B cells can then start producing antibodies such as anti-glyden. And the actual function of, produce, of producing any kind of an antibody is to sequester the antigen, to neutralize it. But again, just like every other immune response in celiac disease, this also goes haywire because the function of this antibody would have been to sequester gluten and prevent it from instigating further response. But as we see with neurological manifestation, the anti-glidin antibodies also have cross-reactivity to our neural tissue. So something that was meant to be a protective signal because of its dysfunction also can lead to uh, clinical manifestations of disease. In addition to providing help to the B cells, the gluten-specific CD4 C cells also prime the CD8 response. Now, CD8 cells are cytotoxic T cells, and these are the cells that then attack the epithelial cells, leading to uh, both cell death, increased uh, hyperplasia within the stem cells, and eventually the loss of balance between turnover and loss due to cell death is what leads to virus atrophy um, in, in this particular model. And we see this both in the patients with celiac disease and in the mouse model that has been developed in Jabri Lab. So why is gluten an immunogenic dietary protein? We consume a lot of other protein. You know, we have eggs, we have uh, other sources of proteins that coming both from plant and animal sources. So what is it about gluten that renders it to be that particularly immunogenic? It's the fact that it has a very high amount of proline and glutamine content. Now, proline is resistant to proteolysis by intestinal enzymes, which means that the, the peptide can no longer be degraded to be too small to be presented by a, pep, by a MHC molecule. Now, MHC molecules will generally present peptides that are about 8 to 12 amino acids in length. And because there is a huge amount of proline that is present in this gluten molecule, it generates multimers of amino acid that are a very good length to be presented by the MHC molecules. The fact that it is gluten, it contains glutamine means that it can be effectively presented by these MHC molecules such as HLA-DQ2 and HLA-DQ8. So it's the physical property of gluten that makes it one, difficult to digest. B, generates amino acid multimers that can be effectively presented by these two particular so the activation of CD40 cells and the induction of their inflammatory sequelae leads to multiple responses and response to gluten ingestion. Um, that can be divided into four different categories. One is, of course, clinical. The other is serological, which is associated with production of antibodies to gliden, endomasium, and tissue transglutaminase 2. Some of the histological features of gluten ingestion that are also mediated by immune activation are increase in the number of epithelial lymphocytes, the least atrophy and crypt hyperplasia. What is being specifically surprising is the fact that there are a lot of neurological symptoms that are associated with gluten ingestion. And then the question becomes that since all other features of gluten ingestion are being mediated through an immune mechanism, are the neurological features also mediated by an immune mechanism? The other feature that is very interesting about um, celiac disease is that even though all these features are mediated by gluten and probably also mediated by the immune activation, there is a delinking between the histological features and the neurological features, which basically means that some patients will have the histological alterations without having neurological manifestations, 
and you'll have other patients that have neurological manifestations without having any histological alteration. Now, this delinking between mucosal damage and neurological response is what is exemplified in this particular study, where they were trying to test the efficacy of TG2 inhibitors in restricting mucosal damage instigated by gluten challenge. So what we see here is the TG2 inhibitor being used at different concentrations being given 30 minutes prior to gluten ingestion, and then a duodenal biopsy to look at the extent of villous atrophy that is observed uh, in these patients. This was a six week trial that included a daily three gram gluten challenge. As we can see here, the transglutaminase 2 inhibitor was quite successful in inhibiting the histological manifestations of gluten ingestion. It was able to inhibit IL infiltration. It was able to inhibit the TG2 response. It was also able to inhibit some of the other functions, uh, uh, other dysfunctions such as those observed in the liver that are associated with gluten challenge. What was surprising though was that none of these, in spite of having such a good restitution in these criteria, the adverse effects that are commonly associated with uh, neuronal activation, which include the clinical features such as head nausea, diarrhea, headache, vomiting, and abdominal pain, were not protected against. Which means that the immune response within the gut is delinked from some of these other functions or some of these other observations associated with gluten challenge that are perhaps not mediated at the tissue site. which, and all of these are features of inflammation. So why would we have uh, neurological manifestations of an inflammatory disorder? Now, to understand that, we need to kind of go back to what the definition of inflammation initially was meant to be. And a very uh, historical perspective on inflammation includes these particular features, heat, redness, swelling, pain, and loss of function. Now, with the advent of cellular and, uh, you know, humoral immunity, we recognize that a lot of these functions were actually being mediated by a particular class of cells called, which we called the immune cells, which include the innate and the adaptive immunity that I talked about earlier. Now, these innate immune and adaptive immune cells are able to produce compounds that can cause vasodilation, which will lead to heat and redness. They can cause leukocyte recruitment and cytokine production that can mediate some of these other features of inflammation. One thing that we have recognized, and this is uh, a lot of researchers starting from 1960s, is that a lot of these features of inflammation do not just have an immune basis. They are also strongly associated with activation of nerve cells, and they are mediated by neuronal mediators. Uh, this was first highlighted in a study where they identified the CGRP, which is a neuropeptide that is produced by sensory neurons, is the potent vasodilator. CGRP being released by neuronal cells can induce vasodilation at various different sites. It can act systemically, it can act locally. So this generates a paradigm where we have inflammation being regulated by a neuronal cue. And more studies from there have led to other examples where we see that these features of inflammation are actually neural, neurally mediated. And what I would highlight here is that pain, which is one of the cardinal features of inflammation is actually completely neurally mediated. It's mediated by TRPV channels that are present on um, neuronal cells. And uh, there is a, a very cool fact about it that Dr. David Julius actually got a Nobel Prize last year for discovering some of these uh, features of the RPV channels on neuronal cells that respond to um, heat, mechanical sensation, thermosensation. So all these features of inflammation can be mediated by neuronal cells. What has come up in the recent studies is also the fact that in addition to affecting these cardinal signs of inflammation, neural cells can also alter the function of immune cells. They can alter cytokine production by immune cells. 
They can alter leukocyte recruitment, which means that inflammation and the features associated with it are not just the domain of the immune system. It involves existence of a, at least a two cell unit, wherein the immune cells and the neuronal cells are able to cross talk and generate an effective response. And it is this effective response that was meant to be protective in response to a pathogen and cell that then becomes dysfunctional in the context of Stegian disease. Now, what was the evolutionary advantage of having a neural control and in inflammatory reactions? Um, and it has been philosophized, uh, philosophized and shown in certain contexts that, uh, you know, we have different parts of the brain that are responsible for different functions that a human body or um, any other host is able to carry out. We have certain areas that are specifically associated with cognitive functions. We have certain other areas that are associated with coordination. But a host has to look not just as the, at the state of its being, it also has to be able to perceive and respond to the inflammatory state. And this was shown in a lot of animal models where sickness behavior, which basically involves that an animal that has had an inflammatory insult has either been, um, either is acting also as a host for a viral or a bacterial infection will also show certain behavioral issues or functions that are often associated with reduced locomotive, cognitive, social, and sexual impulses. Now, this sickness behavior that is associated with dampening of certain behavioral responses in studies has been shown to be protective when a host is being challenged with a pathogen. Now, the advantage of reducing all these functions was to conserve energy so that the host can then focus on simply eliminating the pathogen. And again, it's this, it's this protective function that then becomes dysfunctional in the context of celiac disease, where the host, when the immune system perceives gluten as a pathogen, it generates the same features of the sickness behavior that it was meant to do against a pathogen. Now, how does the brain perceive a uh, presence of anything, uh, a pathogen, a GI pathogen, presence of gluten? That is done through uh, in neural innervations that are present within the gut tissue. And this is the epithelial lining of the gut. And right under the epithelial lining, we have a muscular layer. Now, this muscular layer houses two different regions that are densely innervated and contain cell bodies for neuronal cells. One of them is the submucosal plexi, and the other region is the myotrich plexus. So the cell bodies for a lot of innervations that enter the tissue are actually residing within the gut tissue itself. And it is these cell bodies that form a part of what is called the intrinsic nervous system. But the tissue does not function in isolation. The gut tissue also has a lot of innervations that come from regions, from cell bodies that are outside of the gut. What we are looking at here is sensory neurons, uh, which are present within the dorsal root ganglia, which is present right next to the spinal cord. And the exonal bodies that are present within the dorsal root ganglia also send their dendrites within the tissue. So the gut tissue or the epithelial cells or the innate immune or the adaptive immune cells that are present within the tissue get neuronal input from the intrinsic nervous system and the extrinsic nervous system. What is missing here is the fact that there are, in addition to sensory innervation, there is also sympathetic innervation and vagal innervation within the tissue. All of, it, all of it generates a very dense architecture that makes it possible for the neuronal cells to apprehend what is happening within the gut tissue and relay that signal back to the brain. So what does the presence of this crosstalk mean 
when we think about neurological implications for inflammatory disorders or uh, inflammatory implications for neurological disorders. Now, focusing on input on neuronal cells, what we know from literature and a lot of single cell analysis that has been currently done is that neural cells, in addition to responding to neural cues, also have receptors and signaling molecules that allow them to be competent to respond to an immune generated cue. Now, what does it mean? Now, they have receptors for both pathogen associated molecular patterns and damage associated molecular patterns. I'm showing here an example of uh, 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 RNA analysis done on sensory neurons that were isolated from the dorsal root ganglia. And the expression of TLR4, which was which is thought, which is an innate sensing mechanism that recognizes LP as being generated by E. coli, is present on these neurons. These neurons have expression of TLR5 that recognizes flagellin. They also have other receptors, such as formyl peptide receptor, which are associated with recognizing different pathogen-associated molecules. So what does this do? This basically allows the neural cell to be able to respond to a pathogen-associated molecule. In addition to responding to a pathogen-associated molecule, the brain cells themselves are also capable of responding to cytokines, which are being produced by the immune cells. What I'm showing here is just a few examples of cytokine receptors expressed on the brain. Now, interferon gamma receptor one, which responds to the interferon gamma uh, cytokine that is produced by gluten-specific CD4 T cells in the context of celiac disease. The receptor for this is widely expressed on brain cells. In addition to expressing the receptor, the brain cells are also express the signaling molecules that are responsible for carrying out the inflammatory sequelae. They have the receptor, they have the adapter molecules, which means that overall they can respond to these inflammatory cues. And this is not just restricted to type one cytokine, they also have receptor and adaptive expression associated with a whole range of other cytokines, including those produced by both the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. All of this would allow the brain to directly sense the amount of cytokines that are present either in the periphery, in the systemic nervous system, or within its own microenvironment. And it would allow the brain cells or the neuronal cells to integrate inflammatory cues. One example of neural cells being able to integrate these inflammatory cues is shown here, where the sickness behavior, which is the loss of locomotive activity that is observed both in patients and in animals, is mediated by immune cells in this, um, and also by the vagus nerve. So I'll just go over the experiment as such. So the, the researchers here took mice and gave them LPS intraperitoneally. Now, the presence of LPS in the, in, in the peritoneal cavity will be sensed by innate immune cells that are present within the peritoneal cavity, but it often leads to a systemic inflammatory response wherein we can detect the presence of cytokines in the serum. Now, they did not measure the inflammatory output, but they did measure a behavioral output in these animals. And what they see here is that we can just focus on activity, which is measured by the number of square an animal covers in a limited amount of time. And before any kind of a inflammatory uh, stimuli, the animals have, let's say about on an average about 45 number of attempts to cross each square. In response to LPS though, the animal becomes, decreases its ambulatory capacity. It stays hunched, it stays in a particular corner and refuses to move. Now, this loss of impulse to move is also mediated by the vagus nerve because in animals that have undergone vagotomy, which involves surgical resection of the vagus nerve. <coughs> Excuse me. So in animals that have 
the neural signal surgically resected, the impulse to move is reduced, but not to the same extent. Which suggests that an inflammatory cue is able to alter a behavioral outcome by acting on neuronal cells. In addition to inducing this behavioral response that is mediated by the peripheral nerves, which is the vagus nerve here, what the researchers also show is that the presence of LPS in the periphery is able to instigate an inflammatory response within certain areas of the brain. So if they look at the hippocampus, there is an increased production of IL-1 beta signal, which is also observed in the hypothalamus. And in animals that have undergone vagotomy, this induction of IL-1 beta response is also significantly reduced. So this suggests that the vagus nerve is mediating not just the behavioral response, but also the inflammatory response within the brain to a systemic challenge. Now, where does this become pertinent with respect to a gluten challenge or in celiac patients? Now, this particular study has shown that incidence of gluten is associated with increased levels of cytokines that are present or can be detected in the periphery. So here they gave, uh, uh, celiac patients were given a certain amount of gluten and serum was taken from them at, at distinct times and the amount of cytokine present in serum was detected. What they observed was that a cytokine, which is IL-2, which is often produced by uh, gluten-specific CD40 cells in response to a gluten challenge, this cytokine increases in its concentration in the periphery significantly in response to gluten challenge. And when they measure the nausea scores in these patients, they observe that the nausea score increases at four hours, which is the same time that they see the increases in IL-2, which suggests that a clinical manifestation in, glut in gluten challenge is associated with an inflammatory response observed in the periphery. The study had also tested other cytokines and other doses and found that IL-2 was the one that was most significantly upregulated and most significantly associated with the nausea score. In fact, when they have um, a, a bigger cohort of patients where they're given gluten or gluten peptides through an uh, intradermal challenge, what they observe is that the amount of IL-2 that is observed at four hour time point is significantly correlates with the nausea score observed in those patients. Now, this gives a very strong correlation between an inflammatory response and a neural relay. Now, this correlation between IL-2 and nausea have also been observed in other scenarios, including chemotherapy. So nausea as a side effect of increased systemic IL-2 is something that has been accepted in a lot of inflammatory disorders. And we think this could underlie some of the clinical features that are observed even in patients with gluten challenge. So we looked here at examples where neural cells are able to act as immune cells or integrate immune cues. In addition to doing that, they're also able to generate cues that can be detected by immune cells, such as neuropeptides, neurohormones, compounds such as glucocorticoids and alter the immune function. Some of these studies were pioneered by uh, Kevin Tracy, and he has sh shown him and others have very clearly shown that, uh, what is the example here is a macrophage cell. Uh, a macrophage expresses receptors for acetylcholine, for substance P, and for catecholamines that are produced by neuronal cells, which in this case happens to be cholinergic neurons, sensory neurons, and sympathetic neurons. So in addition to the neural cells being able to integrate inflammatory signals, the inflammatory cells can also integrate neural cues. Where does this become relevant in the case of celiac disease is this particular example, where the, the researchers were trying to look at incidence of oral tolerance. Now, the oral tolerance here is not a completely uh, faithful example of celiac disease. 
but it does recapitulate some of the features. So what happens here is that an animal is given ova through orogastric route. And most oral antigens should be able to generate a tolerogenic response because the microenvironment that is present within the gut is very rich in TGA beta, aryl hydrocarbons, IL-10, that generally generates an immune suppressive response. And it is this lack of generation of an immune suppressive response that then leads to loss of oral tolerance, both in these animal models and also in celiac disease patients. So the experimental layout here is that they either take animals that have undergone rigotomy or pyroflaxty, give them an over challenge or um, through the gastric route. After about two weeks, they generate a scenario where they take over and form an emulsion with a complete Freud's adjuvant and give it subcutaneously in the periphery. Now, this should generate a tolerogenic response, the ova feeding. The presence of CFA and ova together in the, in the, in the periphery will generate an immune response, but it will generate an immune response that the ova tolerance should have negated. So when the animals are then given over challenge in the footpath, the amount of footpath swelling is a reflection of the balance between the tolerogenic response generated by oral feeding and the activatory response generated by the subcutaneous uh, stimuli. In a normal animal that has not seen ova at any time through the orogastric crowd, the balance would shift towards inflammation and there would be a huge amount of footpath swelling because this tolerogenic response was completely absent. In an animal where a prior immunogenic or, or a prior tolerogenic inflammatory response was generated by giving them oral ova, we do not see incidence of footpath swelling. However, this induction of oral tolerance was completely dependent on the vagus nerve being intact because in animals that have been dichotomized, you do not see incidence of oral tolerance. So an animal that has seen ova through an orogastric route is unable to generate tolerogenic response to a peripheral ova challenge. So all these scenarios give us uh, an insight into the complex interplay between neuronal cells and immune cells that not only generate uh, an appropriate response to a pathogen, they also become largely dysfunctional when something like gluten that was supposed to be innocuous is unfortunately seen as a pathogen by the immune system. And it is the fact that the neuronal cells are able to respond to an inflammatory challenge that leads to a lot of clinical and neurological manifestations. So how do we characterize the neurological manifestations that are observed in celiac disease? I would say that they are a dysregulated neuroimmune response. One example of that dysregulation is the fact that molecular mimicry exists, wherein antibodies that were generated to sequester gluten in response to gluten and were supposed to be gluten specific are unfortunately able to recognize some peptides that are present on the neuronal cells. And it is this molecular mimicry which leads to an anti-glidin antibody being able to respond to, act on, and be neurotoxic to the neuronal cells. Now, one thing to consider is that gluten is being ingested through the oral route. So even if the gluten becomes systemic, which has been shown to happen in certain cases, and the antibodies become systemic, the antibodies under normal conditions should not have access to the brain compartments because of the blood-brain barrier which is where the other feature of inflammation associated with gluten ingestion, which involves production of vasoactive amines and cytokines comes into play. Because these cytokines and vasoactive amines are able to act on the activated endothelium and decrease the amount of barrier protection or rather increase the barrier permeability in the host, allowing the antibodies to exit out of the blood out of the capillaries and gain access to some of the black, some of the regions that are present within the brain. Another feature that comes into play when we think about the 
the ability of immune cells to target or the ability of immune products to target neuron cells is that unlike the B cells, unlike the antibodies that have restricted half-life and have a pretty fast turnover, the targeted neuronal cells have limited regeneration. So for example, a B cell, a plasma B cell can survive for about several months. The antibodies themselves can survive for about 30 days. But once a neuronal cell has been targeted and its activity has been ablated, because of its limited capacity to regenerate itself, it may take longer for a neuronal function to come back to its baseline. So some of these examples of these three features of a dysregulated immune response um, uh, will be discussed here. Then. Uh, what we're looking here is the concept of molecular mimicry that exists in celiac patients and is associated with gluten ataxia. Now, movement is associated with the portion of the brain that is cerebellum. So what the uh, researchers here did was they took CIDA from gluten patients, uh, from celiac patients that had gluten ataxia. They took it from healthy controls or from celiac patients that did not have gluten ataxia and put it on brain sections of the cerebellum at different concentrations. So one thing to remember here is that one in 10 healthy controls as Dr. Kroll referred to before this also have anti-glycan antibodies. But what this study shows here is that the affinity and incidence of anti-gluten antibodies that can respond to Purkinje fibers that are present within the cerebellum is much higher in the patients in the first category. Whereas it is significantly reduced when it's taken from a healthy control and absent in patients from celiac disease that do not have gluten ataxia suggesting the incidence of molecular mimicry that is persistent in these patients. Now, molecular mimicry does not, the fact that an antibody can recognize a particular antigen by itself does not mean it will have a function. So this another paper here shows that there is a functional significance to that molecular mimicry. What they did here was they took the patient's serum and injected it directly into the lateral ventricular of the, of the mice brain and looked at the ability of the mouse to respond to rotarot test, which basically is measures both uh, movement and balance. So a mouse that has seen CIRA from both an, a healthy donor and from a patient that suffers from celiac disease but does not have gluten ataxia will not perform any worse on the rotor rot test. However, when serum is taken from a patient that has gluten ataxia, we assume that the antibodies there are able to bind to the Purkinje fibers, induce some kind of neurodegeneration, which can be seen here in loss of movement and loss of coordination capacity even in the mice. All of this shows that molecular mimicry has a functional significance in uh, generating some of the neurological symptoms observed in celiac disease. Now, again, just to be able to see this effect, the, the researchers had to directly inject the antibodies into the brain. Whereas we can perceive other scenarios in celiac disease where the brain does actively become accessible to these antibodies that are present, that are being generated in the gut, but are being present also in the periphery. So we have further immune mechanisms that allow the leaky blood, the blood brain barrier to become leaky. And this is a particular example of um, histological section taken from a patient with ataxia where we can see a lot of immune infiltrate around the perivascular region. So not only do we have molecular mimicry that underlies some of the clinical features of gluten ataxia, but we also have loss of brain barrier permeability that leads to activation and filtration of uh, a lot of immune cells within the brain. Now, how does this play into recovery from ataxia after gluten-free diet? Um, this study enrolled uh, patients and that had gluten ataxia 
and put them on a gluten-free diet or ask them to go on a gluten-free diet rather and looked at the various features of cerebellum um, function, including hand tapping, foot tapping, et cetera. And some of these are um, both cognitive and um, are a function of both cognitive test and a function of uh, locomotion and coordination. And what they observed was that in response to one year of gluten-free diet, most patients showed a significant recovery, a significant recovery from all these features. And the, there are a lot of other studies that have reported that have reported absence of this resolution. However, I think that that absence of resolution might be associated with loss of Purkinje cells themselves, uh, and which might be itself due to irreversible neurodegeneration. One thing to remember is that antibodies can persist for about six to 12 months after gluten-free diet initiation. So it could take a while for the instigator of this inflammatory challenge, which is the antibody to actually go down in, in these patients. Which brings us back to the fact that not only is celiac disease an autoimmune disorder that has a lot of interplay between the immune cells, it also has a significant interplay with neuronal cells that act not just as orchestrators of the immune response, but not just as orchestrators and effectors, but also as a target of this immune response. And it is this interplay that eventually leads to a lot of these manifestations. Uh, with that, um, I'd like to thank you all for this opportunity to present our work and, uh, uh, and thank you for your attention. Dr. Sharma, thank you so much. That was really um, in-depth. It was wonderful. It was a wonderful talk. I would like to invite you to stay on. And if Dr. Kroll and Dr. Nordley would also like to turn on their cameras, we are going to address some of our questions that have come through um, through our Q&A chat. And the first I am going to um, you, Dr. Crowell, if I would like to ask you a little bit more um, about studies for those are, what are your thoughts on studies for those who are in early stages of just being diagnosed with celiac disease? It, you know, one of our questions came through that a lot of studies, most people, one of the criteria is to be on a gluten-free diet for at least a year for a participant. And just with neurological issues presenting, um, I'm just curious what your thoughts are for looking at our patient base that is newly diagnosed and what that might tell us in future studies. Sure. So um, one of the, as I hope I was making clear, what one of the experiments that I uh, gave in the presentation was focused on uh, you know, these celiac disease patients um, at the point of their diagnosis that they were recruited into the study, basically the moment that they, you know, were told. And then I think the assessments and scans and whatnot were done about a fortnight after that. So the, the research is there, um, but I suppose it's potentially a bit more challenging to do. Uh, it there might be a bit of an easier kind of recruitment um, you know, less of a pressure there if, if you can just kind of advertise a study to all, you know, a particular clinicians, existing patients, which might be why there's a bit of a bias there. Um, it, it's obviously very important and relevant, you know, it always, come, it always comes down to a hypothesis in the study. And I suppose in the case of that particular piece of research, you know, we, we were interested in what can we see, you know, that is already there at the earliest point that a doctor has a chance of talking to a patient about it. Because a real motivator for a lot of these neurological things is that the brain doesn't recover in the same way that the gut does after you go on a gluten-free diet. So there's more of a background concern that the longer these things are left without being attended to, you know, you, you're putting yourself more and more into a corner perhaps with it. Um, so, I think that that's what would drive that hypothesis most, <laughs> you know, we, we want to catch these things early. And I think a lot of research, you know, it, 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 it's very relevant to ask, you know, how can we be better at catching people earlier still? So that may be another kind of reverse way of looking at why studies looking at the early presentation of condition 
are more relevant as well. But the research is being done. I agree. I mean, I, I don't think enough research is being done into many of these things as well. Um, but it is there for sure. So if Thank I can you. just piggyback on that, um, if you, the patients that you had in there, the 100 patients, were they, did you look at, I'm sure you did, in terms of how long they'd had the symptoms for, and was there a difference in those that had at least given a history of symptoms for quite some time, whether it was GI or non-GI symptoms? You know, I'm not actually sure that that detail was, was reported in the study. Um, they they were basically they were referred to the gastro side of our specialist center just by the conventional sort of healthcare route so you know they would have seen their gp who made the referral and then uh you know ser serology testing and biopsy etc um that was not a variable that we had i'm not i'm not entirely sure why but no it, it certainly would have been interesting to look at that as well i agree um so yeah things like that would be very good for, for future studies and then if I was to ask Dr. Nordley there, uh, would the same, would you think that doing an EEG on those patients um, would have been helpful? Maybe I'm asking you to stretch your imagination or maybe you have the answer. So if the same patients that uh, Dr. Croyle had, has enlisted, traditional coming in from GI, um, they're sent over for one end. If you were to do an EEG on those patients, would would, what, is there some data to show or what would you think? Um, there's not data to show, but um, you know, they're, they're um, what's the word? They're like uh, complementary. Um, I would view it in that way in the sense that what's good about imaging is it gives you detailed views of structure, not just gray matter, but white matter as, as Dr. Cole was showing us, which is very elegant. EEG on the other hand gives us you know, information about function. So um, in theory, those things could, could uh, go hand in hand. What's nice about EEG is that it's a fraction of the cost and can be repeated many times. You know, scanners are, are hard, you know, expensive to get time on unless you have a dedicated research scanner. And, uh, but EEGs are plentiful and easily done. So if there could be some correlation to the findings that were reported, you know, it'd be hard in the cerebellum because we don't really measure cerebellar activity, but we do measure cortical activity a lot. And the EEG is sensitive to white matter changes and certainly changes in dementia in general. So I would think there probably would be um, correlations that could be picked up. And I know that one of the things that we are looking here at the University of Chicago is looking at from a pediatric standpoint, um, Hopefully we'll get the funding for that. It's the grant is in uh, where we are kind of look, going to look at it proactively. So picking up a cohort of patients, uh, children who've been diagnosed with celiac disease, uh, who have the psychological neurological symptoms and then correlating them with, uh, comparing them with those that don't have the psychological neurological symptoms. And uh, Dr. Nordley has, uh, willingly accepted the challenge to do some of the EEGs on those children and compare, and then of course, look at functional as well. Um, so hopefully our grant will come through and uh, we'll actually get something done. And maybe Dr. Kroll, you'll be giving us some TTG6, TG6 to work on those <laughs> patients. This is my plug to you. Um, <laughs> and maybe we can look at some of that as well. There's a lot more TG6 research along the way, which we're, we're doing at the moment. So yeah, that, that's another watch this space area, I suppose. That's perfect. Fair. That's amazing. Um, Dr. Verma, I want to bring this to you. Is there any evidence of deficient or lack of breastfeeding that is related to celiac disease? Um, you know, there've been a lot of studies done and reports. So a long time ago, we all felt like breastfeeding uh, was really important. Unfortunately, it is still important. So don't get me wrong. Anyone who's into the breastfeeding world, please don't get me wrong. Breastfeeding, excellent, great, please continue. Uh, but there has not been as clear an evidence to show if you breastfeed a child or not breastfeed a child, does that 
make a change in the outcome. Um, what really has been shown is some of the genetics um, that, you know, if you are DQ2 homozygous, if you're a female, um, and then also the amount of gluten that someone gets in a genetically susceptible child, the amount of gluten that you feed your child in the first two to five years is really important. So breastfeeding is a good from a nutrition standpoint, but in the world of celiac disease, at least at this time, it is not been found to be a risk factor one way or the other. And then I want to follow up and um, Dr. Kroll or Dr. Nordley or Dr. Verma, if you could speak to evidence that PTSD or trauma in early childhood could predispose someone to becoming intolerant to gluten. I think this is a question for all three. Uh, yes, all of I don't, know, I don't know about Dr. Nordley, but I'll say well, maybe for, Dr. Sure, for sure, Dr. Sharman Kroll, in terms of the changes in the microbiome and so on. So I would say um, what goes on there, because I think there's a lot that happens. Uh, so maybe Dr. Sharma and Dr. Kroll, you can help us with that. Your thoughts? I, th I think I'd probably pass this mostly on to, to Dr. Sharma. Um, Dr. Verma's right, yeah, the main mechanism I, I can conceive of there would be a kind of stress microbiome alteration response, you know, immune system retraining, all these sorts of questions, which, which I feel I, I'm not the resident expert on this panel on that here right now. So one of the things that happens with both trauma and an inflammatory response is that there is a lot of increase in glucocorticoids which are induced in response to the stress. We have changes in uh, amount of serotonin and dopamine that act both as a neurotransmitter and can act on immune cells. And it's been shown that, uh, for example, in, in celiac patients, the inability to digest tryptophan leads to these long-term changes in the ability of a patient or, or, or a host to effectively produce these neurotransmitters. So that's one area where I can see that some of these effects might perhaps be long lived where you have an initial stressor that alters both the microbiome and the ability of the host to produce serotonin, produce dopamine. Some of these effects are short lived and can be recovered. Some of these effects have been shown to be very, very long lived. So just by changing the metabolic capacity or the amount of these metabolites that are present in the serum, can alter the ability of the host to carry some of these neurological functions and rather make them dysfunctional and induce depression, anxiety. And uh, there are some instances reported in literature for both the host metabolic ability to alter these functions and the ability of the host microbiome to alter these functions. Thank and there's you. There's another axis that might play in. Dr. Verma and I had the pleasure of hearing this wonderful lecture from a cardiologist on the West Coast who talked about the long-term epigenetic consequences of stress. So there is another component aside from microbiome and immune system is, is potential long-term structural changes to you know, transcription of our genome that occur in the context of, of really severe stress. So I think this is, a, you know, this is a topic that he was bringing to us and as he put it, that it could have an impact for 100 years in, in, within a family. And um, so a very, very, very profound effects that he was measuring on cardiac function, so. So from earlier in our session, the previous session, Dr. Nordley, um, there was a question that came along um, uh, Dr. Jericho had presented about the celiac uh, peripheral neuropathy um, and suggested that some of those patients receive immunoglobulin, IVIG. So the question had come on is, how does one justify the use of IVIG in someone who's on a gluten-free diet? And are there any other treatments, options that can be used besides the standard sort of medications for neuropathies? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And, you know, I, and our simplistic um, response to this is, and, 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 and I admit this is very crude, it's like when we're aware of conditions that we think are immunologically mediated through immunoglobulins, our nonspecific response is to give IgG so that hopefully it chelates some of the offensive antibodies, sequesters them, and then they're, ex, you know, excreted from, from the body.
in the hope to downregulate this, this process. Um, so as you said, Dr. Furman, between that and steroids, we, what we need is the kind of the modulators that you know, Dr. Sharma was alluding to. So we, we need to get more specific at targeting the things that are really causing the dysfunction, whether that's, you know, could it be related to cytokines? Um, it's an interesting other theme that I don't know if in your travels, Dr. Sharma or Dr. Verma or others, what is the common, when you think about it, what is the common theme between peripheral neuropathy, cerebellar lesions, and posterior quadrant of the cortex? They're all energy rich regions, you know, that are frequently damaged in mitochondrial cytopathies. So we haven't talked about the mitochondrial uh, potential impact or there are ways of looking at, is some of this leading to mitochondrial apoptosis, you know, that's causing the atrophy that Dr. Crow was showing us. And has it, anyone familiar with work in that direction, Dr. Sharma? No, I'm sorry, I've not really seen it, but as I said, like some of these features were, some of these features of neurological manifestations were kind of hijacked from the ability of the host to downregulate everything that it does not need to do when it sees a pathogen. So it's it's not surprising that these regions that are being affected are the ones that are energy rich because that's what the brain in response to an inflammation would try and shut down. So maybe that leads to some of these effects in the inability of those areas to get the proper energy resource that it does need. But that's an excellent point. Thank you for that. Something that comes to mind uh, for me along those lines, when I was talking about these uh, spectroscopy scans that we do and, and measuring n aspartate, um, I think there's a couple different kind of ideas on like where the NAA is that you measure, but it, it's generally, I believe, only found in neurons. So some people say it can be a measure of neuronal density, but also, it's apparently a marker of metabolic activity within a cell. Um, so when we, you know, take patients and we see that the levels are low, but then after engaging with the gluten-free diet, the levels recover, um, you know, that, that would imply that the lowering maybe can't be from a loss of neurons or else there wouldn't be the potential of recovery afterwards. So I I, I, it's just a quick thought. It, it just kind of seemed, you know, relevant to, to your point about trying to measure these things and, and perhaps see what's going on there. So let me ask you a question. Is that the same? You know, we talk about celiac disease. We talk about non-celiac gluten sensitivity. We talk about uh, gluten allergy and we'll leave the allergy out for now. Um, and again, it's for all three of you. Do you see the same response or in your different fields of expertise, do you see a difference in someone who has non-celiac gluten sensitivity versus celiac disease? Uh, or is it all sort of muddled in as gluten? Dr. Crowell, maybe we'll start with you. Sure. Um, so I, my personal take on this is that I like to kind of see an overall phenomenon that is gluten sensitivity. Um, that can be multi-system, multi-organ, and for reasons which are a little bit beyond our understanding, some people just have that expression more in one organ than another, you know, so, and, and then you, you quickly get into a, a case of semantics after that, right, so, you know, celiac disease is what we call it when it clearly affects the gut in a way which produces, you know, all, all the kind of, uh, downstream consequences um, and gluten ataxia is what we might call it if someone's underlying gluten sensitivity is, has caused a lot of cerebellar atrophy and problems. But, you know, as, as I hopefully showed, that doesn't mean that someone with celiac disease may not also have neurological problems and, and vice versa as well. Um, so that that would be my take on it. That there's a there's a big cloud out there that is gluten sensitivity and it can kind of spike in certain directions, but it doesn't mean that it's necessarily as, as clean as the different terms we come up with for it would imply. Dr. Sharma, or Dr. Nordley. No, and I like Dr. Sharma, I really like Dr. Sharma's cartoon, you know, showing like, oh, we have the helper cells and they are upregulating the B cells that are producing the immunoglobulin. And, and so there's one pathway and then there's the cytotoxic T cells that are hitting the gut. So you could imagine maybe there's different balances in those two pathways within individuals. 
that contribute to the pathogenesis. Do you, is that possible, do you think, Dr. Sharma? Um, I, we don't really have the answer to that because the same CD4 T cell that is going to provide help to B cells should also be able to uh, license the CD8 T cells. And both those cells are present in copious amounts in the gut. So I don't really perceive a scenario where it would be restricting one or the other. One thing that I did observe in my research is that when we think about immunological basis of any particular disease, one of the first things we look at is what's the genetic predisposition, because that is likely to tell us what the mechanism of um, the response is. One thing that I found was that in some of these uh, neurological manifestations, they did have a huge HLA-DQ2 and HLA-DQ8 bias. But I did also find one study that said that about 10% of patients that show glutamate axia or the, some of the complications, neurological complications associated with glutamate also have an HLA-DQ1 isotype, which is present in about 10% of patients, which means that the immune response that's instigated in response to gluten the cells that respond would be, defect, would be different. Perhaps the effector mechanisms would be different. But what I could not find was whether there was any, I could parse out which ones are actually DQ1, what do they have, which ones are actually DQ2 or DQ8, what do they have? Uh, the other thing that often comes to mind is that uh, different regions of the brain, of course, can, you know, have different functions. So when I went into it, I thought different, fun different regions of the brain would express different receptors, and that's why they respond to different things, but I did not find that. One of the things that did come up was the presence of IL-17 that's present in celiac patients, but not present in patients with wheat allergy. And IL-17 is very strongly associated with loss of uh, proprioception and locomotor control. Um, to me, it seemed like the inflammatory environment, both via production of antibodies and by instigating IL-17 response, should have been more biased towards some of these neuronal functions in celiac disease, but not so much in wheat allergy, but I did not really find that. So I was left with this idea that perhaps some of these things are more immunologically specific, but some of them are clearly not. Yeah, that is interesting though about IL-17. It is a putative agent in epileptogenesis, as you may know, yeah. Hmm. Um, what about the possible role of environment? Do you think, you know, normally the immune system shouldn't see our, our brain whatsoever. Is there possibly some environmental thing that transiently opens the blood-brain barrier and allows access and then that response get am gets amplified? I think that is what allows the antibodies and the cytokines. So cytokines are about 17 to 28 kilodalton. So sometimes some of them can passively diffuse across the blood brain barrier, but an immunoglobulin is much bigger. A cell is much bigger. So for any of these cell mediated and humoral mediated responses to occur, the blood brain barrier has to degenerate. Now we know that almost any inflammatory stimuli can do that, which is where trying to parse out what is what specific to become so difficult because studies have shown IL-1 can do it, TNF can do it. Um, so I'm sorry, but I wasn't able to find any sense of specificity in response to a, you know, a particular challenge or any particular region, since it seemed to be so commonly uh, prevalent across all subtypes, both in the brain and in the endothelium. So perhaps in the future, these would be therapeutic sort of interventions besides uh, diagnostic interventions to look at uh, for people with neurological sort of this neurological manifestations that go on uh, before they reach the stage of epilepsy, before we go on into more of a brain structure that is not, or the white matter changes that happen. Is that something you see in the near future, in the far, far away future? Where do you see that? I don't know. In the epilepsy world, people are already talking about that. There are IL-17 modulators. So, I mean, it, it would all have to be tightened up really, really nice and tight if you could say that, you know, as Dr. Kroll started his talk, like if we had really rigorous, you know, clinical biomarkers and we knew, uh-oh, you are susceptible to this, then, then perhaps you could, you know, consider some interventional trial before that, yeah, it's always, it's, you know, an ounce of 
prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? Yeah. What do you think, Dr. Kroll? Where are we with this? Uh, the, so the, the, the kind of like, I'll, I'll be honest, the, the immunological sort of side of this it is, is not my field. I feel like I'm, I'm being outclassed here on this particular subject at the moment. But um, I, I don't know, you know, you, you do hear a lot of increasing chatter at these at these conferences and things. You know, there's a lot of pharmaceutical interests. There's a lot of people out there who really are just focusing on, uh, you know, kind of jumping into the pathways and, and the cascades which happen in celiac disease and trying to interrupt that in some way. It doesn't seem to me to be fundamentally unreasonable, you know, to be trying to do that. that there's nothing there that I'm aware of that means that it, it can't work, you know, if, if it's done in the right way. And then, you know, as, as Douglas was just saying, we can get better in the meantime at biomarkers and patient subtypes and you know identifying those who are most at risk who'd most benefit and you know it seems conceivable certainly that you could wind up with quite a, a clear clinical picture and and you know flow chart to go with that and dr sharma where do you think we are going to go from the mice to people um <clears throat> That part's very interesting. Uh, what we do have currently in Chopri Lab is the, the, the brain fog study that Dr. Keely talked about in session one. So we hope to be able to assess the amount of cytokines that are present in the periphery and look at the brain function and then try and do a multivariate comparison to see which cytokine perhaps is most predictive of which neuronal function and then try and make correlations and perhaps try and go from there into testing it. Um, I think that would be the, immunologically speaking, that has to be the starting point that we identify what goes up in the periphery, what goes up in the brain. Now, of course, unfortunately, we cannot really identify immune cells from the, you know, from the brains of the patients. So that would be a caveat where we're looking at the blood and trying to draw conclusions about the brain. But even then, I think it would have major predictive um, value. Now, one thing to remember is that cytokines generally go up and they will go back down at 24 hours. So it's very important that we do a, a kinetic study where we look at, because something that came up at four hours can affect something that happens 72 hours later. So I think that's where we have to start that we use periphery as a proxy for brain immune response, and then try and correlate immune response in the periphery to the brain functions uh, that some of these studies are gonna be able to do. And then perhaps once we have a correlation, we can run after the causation part of it. In the mice, uh, we do have some studies that we are trying to define currently, because uh, Dr. Jabri has a CDF model where we can, we see the villus atrophy. And so we hope to be able to recapitulate some of these studies in the mice and then um, get those causation correlation um, kind of experiments going on even there. But I, I think it's a bit great that we're not there yet. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm going to do, I know I'm being told time is up, but I'm going to ask you one more question. This is going along with the, you talk about looking at what's in the periphery. So we talk about antibodies and as a simple gastroenterologist, uh, what do I do for patients that I think might have celiac disease is you go into the tissue translutaminase, the TTG2, um, you look at the endomyceal and sometimes you do the deamidated gliadin. Um, there was a question much earlier in the previous session about anti-gangliocide antibody and maybe um, Dr. Nordley can enlighten us on that. Do we add, again, Dr. Kroll, I would think I know your answer. Do we add the gliadin in our thought process? Do we only save the gliadin for um, those have neurological symptoms. And again, I say that with a cringe, neurological symptoms, because how do we really know unless everyone is being evaluated by a neuropsychologist and a neurologist? So what would you suggest um, as a, in a real clinical, practical sort of manner? And I'm going to come back to TG6. When does TG6 become um, as a forefront something in the clinical field? So what would you recommend as a panel that we should do? Uh, the role of anti-gangliocide and also the TG6. 
Dr. Nordley, maybe you can take us on the anti-gangliocyte antibody journey. Oh, oh my, now you've outclassed me, Dr. Berman. <laughs> 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 yeah, I can't really intelligently comment about, about that, honestly. Um, if I could just though go back to a point that Dr. Sharma was making, um, it just has so much, uh, it, it reminds me so much of, we did this long project with febrile seizures causing damage, you know, status in febrile seizures. And we found the highest correlation was with the cytokines. And, and it wasn't as Dr. Sharma's pointing out, it's very challenging in terms of the kinetics of it. So we found out that we had to measure the ratio. And when we did that, the ratio of, of you know, potentially competing substances, then we found a really high relative risk ratio for neuronal damage. So um, I, I think that's a, a cool area. So that was a little bit of what's that called? Like a, um, an, an evasive response because I don't have an intelligent answer to your question. No, no. I think that you bring up a good point of should cytokines be part of our profile um, as assessment. So uh, Dr. Correll, what do you think? Sure. You'd make a good politician, Douglas. <laughs> but uh, no, so I can certainly ramble on about glycine antibodies. Um, so I, I think, you know, it, it, the first point of kind of contact, if you're suspecting celiac disease, I know there's a large discussion going on at the moment. Is serology all you need? Do we still need the biopsy, et cetera, et cetera? I think if you're confirming TG2, EMA, maybe deamidated gliadin, you know, in your tests, you don't also need to test the gliadin. Like it, it's, I don't think that's going to add anything to that clinical picture. It's pretty much a sure thing that that's going to be there as well. Um, after that point, I think it, well, the way that we use it is it becomes useful in a, a diagnosis of exclusion sort of route. So this clinic, which I've referenced a few times is placed within a larger ataxia center. So, you know, we, we see all causes of ataxia um, turning up and many of these are genetic causes, many of them are idiopathic as well. Um, and you can actually look in a cohort of idiopathic ataxia cases, you know, who haven't come from with a celiac disease referral or anything, they're kind of just at the ataxia center, if you will. And forgive me, I can't remember the exact percentage, but gliadin antibodies are very overrepresented in that group. Um, and, I think the way that it's run at our center is that, you know, if these kind of telltale neurological signs are there, it is worth doing a gliadin antibody test because that's kind of the only thing that remains that kind of picks up the full spectrum of gluten sensitivity. If that is positive, it's then at least worth suggesting trying a gluten-free diet. And many patients actually say that, you know, very quickly they notice a very marked improvement after they do that. And, you know, at that point, you, you're very well justified, I think, in continuing to recommend it. TG6, I think, is, is really interesting with things are still at a very early point with that, um, because, you know, we're still, similar to gliadins, you know, we're still trying to sort out what the prevalence of that is in, in a healthy control population as well. But there's been some early data on that, but there's not been anything which has been really well powered yet. Um, but we are actually doing that at the moment, that, that's another thing which is ongoing. So I think in the very near future, we'll have a much clearer picture of, you know, sort of sensitivities and specificities of that test and, and what kind of situations it would be good to use it in. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. What do you think? Uh, we should be checking peripheral ILs of all sorts? Uh, as in, uh... I think it would be hard because as I said, cytokines are transient. They come and they go. And even though we can, some cytokines come up early, some of them come up later. So we can think of envisioning the scenario where we say, okay, do we then start doing ratios? And if we do ratios, perhaps they would have a better predictive value because they will take into account the kinetics of these early mediators versus the ones that are produced later in an inflammatory response. However, it would still have to be done within a particular window for it to be sensitive and specific enough. Uh, someone who's had gluten ingestion three days, you know, past, I'm not quite sure if it would have the same predictive value. Within a 20, 12 to 24 hour window, perhaps yes, because that's what we see uh, as the window that's even predictive in, septic, in patients with septicemia. Um, 
but I'm not quite sure about the kinetics of the immune response in response to a gluten challenge. When does what come up and how far along does it stay and when does it go away? Well, Dr. Sharma, Dr. Verma, Dr. Crowell, and Dr. Nordley, thank 